Is there a different perspective you have now on the recording process and in the touring process than you did when you were starting out or in the, in the midst um, of all the successes you had? I think it changes yearly, you know, your attitude to the business changes because the internal change within the whole structure is completely different all the time. I mean, for example, we've just had our first uh, number one in England, which was a load down, you know, um, that that's new. So, yeah, my personal um, my personal changes um, are wide and varied, really. You know, when you're touring now, there's a lot more media that you can push the buttons with. There's a lot more you can do if you choose to do it, of course. Um, Recording is a lot easier. You could do some great demos in your bedroom, which could be transferred by Pro Tools, and you could start to make the master from that. It's got to that stage. Uh, so it's a very exciting time. It's a little bit of a worrying time because there's lots of uh, legal um, things which aren't in place. I still think about it. the drift as far as accounting to musicians, as far as um, the net is concerned. Um, there's a few loose ends around the world in that area, PRS and how you get paid on various stuff. Um, and basically the law has to keep up with technology, which it doesn't do as quickly as what it should do. So that's a problem. So it is a never-changing world within the, um, within the music business. Nevertheless, it's very exciting. There's lots of different music today than when I very first started. I mean, the, I mean we didn't have um, bass and drum, we didn't have rap music, we didn't, you know, and you could go on and on and on. So I, I think it's kind of encouraging. I think it's encouraging. Uh, I think punk opened up a lot of uh, people's attitudes and just laid something down in such a way where everybody can make music if you want to. And now everybody can actually make good music if you want to because of technology. I mean, we've got machines that will uh, retune a voice. If the guy's singing out of tune, mm -hmm. you can retune the voice. I mean, this is just incredible. It, it's, it's great for the person who's got the talent. I remember a conversation I had with George Martin. Mm -hmm. I didn't call him Sir then because he wasn't a Sir, but Sir George Martin. And he said that sometimes having too many toils actually stifles creativity because mm. now anyone can have first class sounds. A producer can push a button and have an oboe, but they know nothing about the way an oboe is played or its entrance. No. Um, that's true, um, but that's okay. It's the end result and how you get to it. I think um, the problem, if that's an artistic thing which you're talking about, I think you really have to look at the fact that you know, that's going to happen. The more information you give people, the more educational material you give people, like DVDs, and there's so many in shops these days, the quicker people are going to learn to play, but will they be original? Will they be cloned? Will they just be copying all the time? And there is that element, you know, always. But nevertheless, I mean, you've got to make these things work for you now. And uh, uh, I think it's generally a healthy time Slightly confused, but healthy. How do you measure, or how do you weigh your, the values between artistic integrity and commercial success? How do you balance that? You seem to always have had <coughs> integrity in what you've done. Mm -hmm. um, the now it's a matter of making money with it. Yes, well, you yeah, you've got to be able to cover all bases. As far as the commercial side, for example, the Carl Palmer band, what I play is not commercial, and I have no intention of it being commercial. It's, um, it's focused at um, a specialized market, people who are interested in um, prog rock with a European overtone. I'm using classical adaptations as my vehicle to get to that point, as well as some original material, and as well as material from my past, um, Emerson, Lake and Palmer pieces, which I'm only playing about three of, but I am playing them. Um, when I've had my commercial success in my life, it's been it's been luck actually. I mean, I wouldn't have known that um, the first Asia album would have been a number one for nine weeks, the album and single, seven consecutive weeks. I would never have known that. You don't know that. Um, it, it was at the beginning of MTV, so that would have been a massive help. We do realise that, but. Um, I've never really been involved with anything uh, as far as 
let's make an album just to make money. Let's be as commercial as what we can. I've been very fortunate not to have ever had to um, um, make an album just to make money. If it's sold, then it's been fantastic. Uh, if it's ended up being commercial for that moment in time, then that's great as well. I think Asia is a prime example of a band that had a lovely balance between a sort of prog rock, because we couldn't play 20 minute pieces in 1981, they were like down to seven minutes or six minutes, uh, and we had commercial songs as well. Coincidentally, it all seemed to work on the same album. Um, when we did try to make albums that were commercial, they didn't sell that well at all. When we looked at the singles thing and we went that way, and it is a mistake, I was in the band as well, so I was to blame, though I didn't write the bulk of the material. Um, if you ever go down that path, you always trip up, really. You've got to write what you believe in, you've got to play with what you believe in, and if it works at that moment in time, in the, in, out there in the field, then great. Let's go back many years. Madison Square Garden. Yeah. You're about you're about ready to walk on a stage. I'm sitting in the audience of twenty thousand other people. Mm -hmm. You're you're waiting. You're walking down that tube behind this backstage, and when there's this black curtain, there's a flashlight that's leading you to the top of the mm -hmm. stairs. You're about ready to get behind the kit. You have your timpani there. Mm -hmm. Is it several, temp, several timpani? Is that called timpani or timpani? Yeah, I had two temps. Two, two. Um, and then let's remember there's a feeling that you're having there just mm. before you walk on that stage, which you may have wanted to experience when you started playing. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people today, they come into it saying, I want to be like that. That's my role model. Mm -hmm. And they don't go through the motions of... Um, paying their dues to get there, or right. something that you did and your bandmates mm -hmm. did, mm -hmm. many people did. What did it feel like to realize that you've done A, B, C, to X, Y, and Z, and here you are, about ready to walk up those couple of steps, to hit the stage, to walk behind your kit, and there's 20,000 people screaming. Mm. And there's a symphony orchestra there too. Mm. What was that moment feel like? Um. It feels very natural actually. It doesn't feel out of place. It definitely doesn't feel uncomfortable. Um, it's not a nerving situation. You don't feel nervous or apprehensive. It's, um, you couldn't turn back. You can't turn back, but it's incredibly rewarding as you're making that journey through the tunnel or whatever it is they have there. Uh, for me, it was. It was just another day at the office, to be honest. And I don't mean to be blasé when I say that, but when you rehearsed as much as what we did, and you did the preparation and the forward planning and all the bits and pieces that go with um, putting something like that together, there's an air of excitement that you've already conditioned yourself, conditioned yourself to expect, you know. Um, the fans, you don't know if they're going to like it. You you don't know how well it will go down. Um, at the end of the day, whilst you care what they think and how it works, it's basically a selfish mode you're in because you, we did this for ourselves. You know, I think the best music is created for people who are selfish. And Emerson, Lake and Palmer just wanted to do the best for themselves. And if it was, if it became world-renowned, if it became accepted by the mainstream, by the majority of people, however you want to you know, perceive that, then that was great. So that, for me, was just a, a great luxury. That's how I looked upon it. Was the chemistry on the stage similar to the chemistry in the studio? The, the two environments are completely different because the chemistry that on stage is generated by the enthusiasm of the audience. Uh, 